delighted to hear your... Sure, it's Morris Cunningham. I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts uh, at Boston. Um, I had a wonderful lead-in on, uh, on Marty Gillens, but I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll submit that portion of my testimony, uh, which was to be not only on Marty Gillens' research, but a great deal of recent research by political scientists on the impact of uh, money in politics, which is, uh, I think, more frightening in a lot of ways than we think. Uh, but in e to keep it short, as the chairman encourages, I'll just t tell you probably why I'm here. I I've come to research dark money in politics in the last few years. Citizens United brought upon two real curses, I think. One, uh, the vast sums of money we've seen in politics, uh, and also uh, new techniques to keep that money hidden so that the voters don't know who is contributing uh, money. I spent a good deal of my career trying to avoid studying money in politics. Uh, but uh, about three and a half years ago, in a January uh, uh, copy of the Boston Globe, uh, I read a story that um, uh, was about the charter's possibility of a charter school ballot campaign. And the story said that the charter ballot uh, advocates would spend up to $18 million. Now, I didn't know anything about charter schools, but I knew something about Massachusetts politics. $18 million is an extraordinary sum. It's, it's far and away more than... So I began to think, who has that kind of money? Where is this money coming from? And then I found out something else, which was there was no way to find out where that money was coming from. <laughs> So I did. I did. I spent a lot of time researching, and I found out where a great deal of that money was coming from, and I wrote about it. We have a mass politics profs political science blog here in Mass, and I wrote about it, and it made its way into the campaign somewhat. Never made its way into the mainstream media, by the way, for the most part. Um, Afterwards, uh, the Office of Campaign Political Finance, our state agency that does a sort of parallel of FEC, did conduct an investigation, and eventually, 10 months after the voters could have used the information, because we can't do this during campaigns here in Massachusetts, in September of 2017, OCPF uh, announced a ruling that the big contributor to the Great Schools Massachusetts Ballot Committee, a, dark, a 501c4, as we heard earlier, named Families for Excellent Schools, would have to register as a ballot committee and disclose their contributors. When that disclosure happened, it turned out a lot of the people I'd been finger fingering were on that list, others were not. But for example, disclosure. When we run a disclosure ad, we get to see the top five contributors, right? And there was Families for Excellent Schools, Great Schools for Massachusetts, uh, Strong Economy for Growth, tells you nothing. Well, once we got the real disclosure, guess what? It turned out to be four people from Massachusetts and two Waltons from Arkansas. I'll give you six, who put in half, well, eventually went to $25 million. These six people put in half of that money, $12.5 million, all in the expectation that their names would never be disclosed. But it did happen. When you tie together financial firms tied to these other Massachusetts people, you get about another $4 million in dark money. So these are extraordinary sums. This is no way to run a democracy. Um, OCPF kept at it. And eventually, we found that in f there were four ballot uh, measures in Massachusetts in 2016. Three of them had been conducted on one side with illegal dark money. One of them from overseas dark money. Right? They all lost, by the way, interestingly enough. But uh, this is a real, when you have three out of four of your elections on ballots being conducted, Illegally, I think it's a crisis. The sums are extraordinary, so there's, there's, there's that aspect of it. I will say one other thing to get back to Citizens United because I want to let other people testify. Um, the only, uh, the big thing in Citizens United, I guess the positive was that disclosure was upheld. Uh, tomorrow in federal court here, there's a case being heard uh, called Mass Fisc uh, on a motion by the Attorney General to compel. Uh, Mass Fiscal Alliance versus Sullivan, Sullivan being the head of OCPF, and what Mass Fiscal is trying to do is to overturn, on First Amendment grounds, Massachusetts disclosure law. So we may be thinking, ah, at least disclosure survives Citizens United. Don't think the forces behind Citizens United are not out there with the long-term game plan to get rid of disclosure as well. With that, I'll, I'll end my testimony and be happy to take any questions.
Thank you. Thanks for your uh, for your testimony and for your scholarship, which I think is very uh, informative for us. Um, I, I had a question um, uh, related to OCPF or the state uh, state regulations. Is there anything that OCPF is not currently doing that you think would be helpful for them to be doing so that we could more closely monitor and have greater transparency, et cetera, or any type of data that you would like to see them provide or collect or otherwise make available that is not currently being uh, collected? I think if I had my wish list with OCPF, the, first, the, the one thing I would like to see them be able to do, and this is the, the this is the legislature. They cannot do this. I would like them to be able to make a determination during a campaign when money is coming in. This is done in other states. It's done in Idaho, in another education case down in Idaho uh, in 2014, I think it was. A superior court ruled for disclosure. People, the voters in Idaho, got to see who was putting this money in. Mm -hmm. Voters have an you know voters have an absolute right to know what's going on. Uh, in this. They have a right, and that right needs to be upheld. This money can't be uh, shunted or, or, or held secret behind fancy sounding names that are oh so positive families for excellent schools. Guess what? There are no families. I can give uh, you some, I can give you a ring of a whole lot of names where there's no patients for affordable health care. There's no patients. It's a guy from Texas named John Arnold. Enron money. Thank you, Professor. A, a question or two on the constitutional amendment issue um, that would reverse Citizens United in other cases. So Massachusetts once had a law prohibiting corporations from spending money to influence the outcome of ballot initiatives. Um, that was struck down in a case called Bilotti, an early version of yeah. the Supreme Court's current approach to the First Amendment. Um, do you believe Massachusetts people should have a right to limit and exclude corporate money from ballot initiatives or citizens' initiatives? That's been since 1978, but yes, I do believe. So you'd like to see an, amend an amendment that would allow us to make that choice would, would be good? Much, I would very much like to see that, yes. Okay. And you mentioned that six people accounted for over half of a $25 million ballot initiative? That's right. Um, and three of, th three of whom are involved in a... 501c3, to refer back to the testimony of Mr. Curran, that was funding, before any ballot committee was formed, that was funding uh, Families for Excellence Schools, the, the 501c3 version of Families for Excellence Schools in Massachusetts. So this is a long stream of money. There's upstream money and there's downstream money. The upstream money is, is flowing to do the things that Sean Curran was talking about through nonprofit 501c3s. Downstream money for the for the campaign and the ballot committees, but yeah, they they're the source of the money. Okay, so if, if six people can have such influence, um, would you support a constitutional amendment that would enable Massachusetts to decide that more citizens should have more influence and therefore allow limits on the money that could be spent by one person or six people? I I do, and I think that is merely echoing what Sean Cowan said and what uh, Senator Rubin said earlier. There's no question about it. Thank you. Would you go so far as to uh, support uh, change that would uh, require contributions to come only from within districts or states or whatever the jurisdiction is uh, affecting a particular issue? I can't say, Commissioner, that I've thought enough about that question at all. I, I, I see the same thing Senator Rubens has seen. I've seen it in a, a house race up here last year, uh, but I haven't put enough deep thought into that question to give you a confident answer. Other commissioners, questions? Okay, let's then move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it.